Hello, and welcome back to the third and final part of the RSET training, Satellite Remote Sensing for Urban Heat Islands. We are delighted to be joined today by George Xi'an from the U.S. Geological Survey, Kevin Gallo from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and Greta Paris, Sabine Nix, Thomas Quintero, and Amanda Tomlinson, all from the NASA DEVELOP program. As a reminder, all webinar recordings, PowerPoint presentations, and the homework assignment can be found on the training page at the link provided below. There is one homework assignment for this webinar series, which can be accessed from the website. The homework must be submitted via Google Forms by the due date of December 1st. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the due date. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marina Spartin. For the final part of this three-part webinar series, we are delighted to have a handful of guest presenters who will be discussing their research mitigating urban heat islands via long-term climate monitoring. Our first guest presenter is Dr. George Xi'an, a research physical scientist for the U.S. Geological Survey, Earth Resources Observation and Science Center, who researches the National Land Cover and Land Cover Database, Land Cover Change, Urban Land Change, Land Cover Change Impacts on Climate and Ecosystems Using Remote Sensing Information. George has specialized in using multi-type remote sensing data to characterize land change and change assessment across the United States. He has also used Landsat thermal information to study urban environment change by collaborating with other researchers from different government agencies and universities. Dr. Xi'an serves as Editor-in-Chief for Remote Sensing Application, Society, and Environment. He also serves as an Editorial Advisory Board member for the ISPRS Journal of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, and a Steering Committee member of Wetland Mapping Consortium. We're excited to have him contributing to this webinar series, and without further ado, over to you, George. Hello. Uh, my name is George Xian. I work for the USGS uh, Earth Resources Observation and Science Center in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And uh, I have another presenter, uh, Kevin Gallo. He's working on uh, NOAA, and he's going to talk another topic. So for me, for today's topic, I'm going to talk about urban heat islands observed from a time series of remote sensing data. The goal of this, this project study focusing on using remote sensing data, especially land surface temperature from Landsat and Lens Ready data, we call ARD, with land change products to characterize the thermal features of the land surfaces. The project developed a framework to assess the urban heat island intensity <clears throat> spatial distribution and the change over time from the 1980s to the present. And the product provided from this project will be used to monitor urban heat island change in major cities in the United States. For this work, we have several collaborators with us, including USGS National Land Imagery, U.S. EPA, U.S. GCRP, that's a global change research program, and a NOAA, and here's my contact information. We know that urban heat island occurs in urban areas. Roads, buildings, and parking lot, those materials usually trap and hold the heat, pushing urban temperatures higher than surrounding area, even at the night. And the uh, urban heat island was intensified over near, identified nearly 200 years ago, but detailed information are uh, still limited. The hurdle 
for urban heat island research and, and applications, we need to overcome including the temperatures varies from block to block, how we're going to estimate those changes, we call the spatial distributions. And if we use climate station, climate records, those records are limited at a fixed locations. And the satellite data can be used to track surface temperature with more details, but observation are still limited. And the surface temperature usually do not align exactly with air temperature. So let us give us some differences between the two. And also the impact of landscape dynamics on urban heat island effect is very limited. I want to use this graphics we call surface albedos of different land cover types to explain what is the cost of urban heat island effect and what is the major uh, imp effect to impact heat island. We know surf the land surface temperature is controlled by surface energy balance and energy is balanced by incoming solar radiation, we call it a short wave, and outgoing long wave radiation and surface energy fluxes. The surface albedo plays an important role in receiving short wave radiation. The surface energy balance determines surface land surface temperature, we call LST, that is a key fact in quantifying urban heat island intensity. From this chart, we know that built up lands have relatively lower vegetation cover and lower albedos. More incoming solar radiation could be received on those surfaces and push daytime surface temperature higher than the surrounding rural area. The surface temperature observed by Landsat is in the morning time and the UHI we studied is so-called daytime urban heat island. We are using remote sensing surface temperature data and the land cover information to investigate urban heat island and the change. The information can be used for heat warning, mitigation efforts, heat wave climate indicator, and the socioeconomic research and, and analysis. This research used Landsat analyzed ready land surface temperature to generate annual mean temperature. So this temperature data from Landsat ARD can be used to generate annual mean temperature at 30 meter resolution. And when we do this one, we use, we call all clear satellite observations from 1985 to present then we can use this one to calculate the annual temperature. And also we can use ground stations to compare our surface temperature with air temperature. And algorithm we used in this project is repeatable for any cities and year by year. I want to use this example to show you what the surface temperature looks like and also what the landscape looks like. So this is a high resolution image from Atlanta areas in Georgia. So from here, you can see this is a pretty much like an airport in Atlanta. And then this is our Landsat surface temperature. We calculate use Landsat ARD record. So for all the black from black to yellow to green, Rep, uh, to blue, light blue, represent temperature from higher to medium to low. So compare with the temperature uh, land cover information, we can see the higher resolution image shows the high intensity urban area, and then the surface temperature shows the relative higher surface temperature in airport areas than in surrounding, in surrounding area. And we know that the land, land surface condition is controlled by so-called land cover change. And we want to use 
land cover change information to connect with variations of urban heat island effect. We look at land cover change developed by the USGS and connect the land cover change to the land surface temperature. Here is, in general, land cover and urban land cover change in Atlanta area. So the wet on the right graphics is existing urban since 1986. And the right is a new urban development after 1986. So you can see from this graphics, you can see where's a new urban popped up in these areas. At the same time, we wanted to look at the land cover change, not just land, not just urban land, also surrounding long urban land. That is important attribute to urban heat island intensity. So from these graphics, we learned that in that area, land cover change shows that urban development consumed many from forest land in the area. And after that, we can, we can see that the temperature change in different land, urban, and land cover, and long urban lands. I'm sorry, this is no animation, but I can see that. Uh, the graphics shows that urban land change and annual land cover is associated with the annual surface temperature over the urban and the rural area. So generally, the high intensity urban representing industry, commercial centers, airport, and other high intensity residential buildings usually has higher land surface temperature. And uh, for this graphics, we see that the temporal trends is about 0.1 degree per year. And the general urban land surface temperature is about 0 0.05 degree per year. So that's in general in this area. And we also can see that from this graphics to see that the differences, or we call urban heat island intensity, show the largest intensity is from high intensity urban to rural area. And the difference of surface temperature can reach over six degree between high intensity urban and rural area. The maximum temperature that is calculated by using seasonal high temperature also shows much higher surface temperature differences and trends. So in general, we can see high intensity urban area has high intensity in urban heat island effect, as well as high trends or large trends for their temperature difference change. We also look at other regions that this one is Minneapolis, St. Paul Airport in Minnesota. Uh, just the one state in the south, south uh, middle, middle west uh, cities. So here we can see this is the airport and the surrounding neighborhood areas. And also we can look at the temperature variations associated with these land cover conditions. And in general, the airport has higher land surface temperature than surrounding low intensity areas. But the magnitude of land surface temperature varies block by block, pixel by pixel. We talked about the so-called pixel level surface temperature. And for a lot of applications, we also can link those temperature ways, so-called the human activities. For example, we can use US Census tractor to calculate the mean temperature for each tractors and uh, connected to the human intensities. So here are two examples show in Atlanta and also in Minneapolis. You can see in some tractors, the temperature is relatively higher than other surrounding tractors. So in this one, we can show the spatial distribution of the surface temperature and their potential impact with human intensities. 
we can also look at another example. So this one is from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. That's the city we located. And on the left, the graphic shows urban development from 1986 to 2017. And the green number shows exist, we call it existing or persistent urban area. And the other colors shows the new urban growth that's use different land cover type. For example, in this area, majority new urban development is uh, de uh, accomplished by, you, by consuming cropland in this area. So you can see in Sufos area, we have this, we call the development pattern pretty much like a southwest east patterns. And we have very few development in, on the north side. And at the same time, we can use our Landsat uh, record to calculate the diff temperatures for different land cover type. For example, for this one, we can see in the water, we have general temperature mean, annual mean is about 18.8 degree, and the cropland got the 23.6. However, in the high intensity urban, we have temperature about 26.7 degree. So if you count the difference, we call the urban heat island intensities, then you can see for those areas, especially the downtown Sioux Falls, we have a relatively higher temperature, uh, we call high intensity urban heat, heat island. And uh, we also want to use the high resolution image to show you what the landscape looks like in the downtown Sioux Falls. So you can see in the downtown area, we have very dense building road and uh, very limited vegetation cover. And the surrounding area, we have a neighborhood, have grass, trees, so relatively higher vegetation. And then if you look at the Landsat developed surface temperature, definitely we can see in the downtown area, the temperature is relatively higher uh, than the surrounding rural area. And the surprise to see that followed by the river and there is a green space uh, on both sides of the river, then we just off the downtown, then we can see the relatively lower temperature showed up in this region. We can also use so-called uh, other information to uh, to identify urban heat island effect in the local side. So here is an example to show you how we use high resolution image to uh, pan shop our coarse resolution image and then get the land surface temperature distribution in the Sioux Falls area. So on the left is our pan shop high resolution land surface temperature. And on the right side is our Landsat image. So you can see in this graphics, after we pan shop high resolution image, then we got a very detailed structure about land surface temperature distribution in these areas. And in the future, we're going to develop so-called the 3D effect. And then to show the buildings, the blocks, and associated with the temp uh, surface temperature. And uh, in Sioux Falls area, we also uh, look at the so-called in the buffer zone, then we calculate the temperature differences. So this one is temperature difference in 1986 and 26. So 1986, we have small size of urban, and then the high temperature, the difference is in the center of the, of the town. And in 2016, the temperature, the urban area expand. And then we can see a lump of so-called high temperature spot popped up in this region. If we try to room in our temperature differences, so you can see in the Sufos area, we have a lump of trees with very relatively higher temperature than the surrounding. So one is downtown. We start over there in the center, and another one is on the north side nearby the airport. We have a lot of commercial buildings over there. And also on the south side, we have a block called the shopping centers over there. We also have relatively higher temperature. 
And also another graphics on the right side is we call is a temperature we call hot spot. That means in the persistent er, urban area, we want to identify those areas that have higher temperature than its surrounding area. So you can see from this graphics, we show that those areas normally have a temperature about four degree higher than its surrounding area. Some place they even have more than six, more than about six, uh, more than ten degree warmer than the surrounding. So one, for example, when the shopping centers or the uh, in the south central, uh, we have very 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 high temperature over there in so forth. So through this kind of analysis, we can identify the spatial distribution of urban heat island effect, and also we can identify where we have most intensified urban heat island uh, intensities, and uh, we call it hot spots. And it's, those information are very important for the mitigation in the urban management. Another example we wanted to look at is, I, we just talked about using Landsat uh, data to estimate surface temperature, and then we can estimate urban heat and intensities. We also have a number of other satellites we can use to do such a study. And uh, currently, NASA just launched uh, another sensor called EcoStress. EcoStress uh, can observe the thermal conditions from the surface and in much higher spatial resolution and also much higher temporal coverage. And uh, they also can collect the information from the daytime and the nighttime. So we use this one to give a demonstration to show how we use this, this thermal information from both ecosystem, eco stress and the Landsat to estimate surface temperature. So this is in Chicago area. On the left is eco stress, on the right is Landsat. So generally we calculate this one based on so-called zip code in that region. And then we can see in downtown Chicago, we have relative higher temperature over there, and definitely. And also both sensors detect those temperature in a very good level, and also the patterns are very similar. So that's gave us uh, the conclusion that we can use those additional thermal information to add to our Landsat record to enhance our temporal and also spatial resolution. Another one I want to mention is we also can use so-called surface weather and climate station data to connect to our urban heat island information derived from the satellite. So here, you, if you remember, I mentioned in both Georgia, Atlanta, and Minneapolis, so we saw the urban heat island, especially in the intense, high-density urban area, we have increased trends over there. And then here, we try to use the called minimum temperature that's uh, recorded of in from the daily temperature, uh, temp air temperature uh, from the weather stations and calculate it from the July and August. Then we can calculate its mean and also we can calculate so-called the 90 percentile days. And we, that means the temperature in those days are hotter than is 90, 90 percentile of the rest of the days. So we record that days in the red bar, and then the 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 black line shows the its temporal trends of air temperature. So from this graphics, we can see both cities. We show the minimum temperature in July and August as apparent increased trends, and in Minneapolis even significant trends. At the same time their holiday also increases in those regions. And uh, our next analysis, we're going to connect closely with our annual urban land surface temperature information with so-called air record information to investigate heat wave in different metropolitan areas. 
The last one I want to see is our land surface temperature data that have been published in the USGS, what we call science space website. And uh, everyone can go to the website to download those information, those data. And, uh, and also we plan to deliver land surface temperature from 1980s to present and change a product for all major cities in the US and also use the data to monitor urban heat island change across contaminous US. That's all from my presentation. Thank you for your listening. That was brilliant, George. Thank you so, so much. Our next guest presenter is Dr. Kevin Gallo. Dr. Gallo is a physical scientist with the NOAA Center for Satellite Applications and Research and is currently a visiting scientist at the USGS Earth Resources Observation and Science Center, where he is the lead investigator on several collaborative research efforts related to land-atmosphere interactions. Kevin's current research activities include the use of medium and high-resolution satellite data and in-situ data to validate NOAA operational satellite data and products, satellite-based analysis and assessment of urban environments and their influences on the local environment at climate observation stations, and the combined use of low Earth orbit and geostationary satellite data for monitoring land surface properties. Today, Kevin will be presenting on land surface temperature products available from the geostationary operational environmental satellites, known, known more commonly by their acronym GOES. Over to you, Kevin. In the previous presentation, several excellent examples were presented of monitoring urban heat islands with data from polar orbiting satellites, for example, Landsat. In this presentation, data from a geostationary orbiting sensor will be presented to demonstrate the advantage of using multiple sensors for assessment of urban heat islands. My name is Kevin Gallo, and I'm a research scientist with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, NOAA is the United States agency that oversees operations of the Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite, GOES, series of satellites, and utilizes much of the data acquired by the sensors on board the satellites in observation and prediction of weather events. Geostationary satellites, including the GOES satellites, rotate with the Earth such that they stay in a constant position relative to the Earth and can monitor the Earth's surface 24 hours per day. The disadvantage of this orbit is that due to the altitude of the satellite above the Earth's surface, about 36,000 kilometers compared to 700 kilometers of polar orbiting satellites, the satellite spatial resolution of the data from the GOES sensors is typically greater than that of similar polar orbiting sensors. There are currently two operational GOES satellites that offer views of North and South America, designated GOES East or GOES 16 and GOES West or GOES 17. The satellites are positioned over the equator at latitudes identified and as noted by the lighter blue color, there is an overlap in the coverage by the two satellites. The land surface temperature product available from the GOES Advanced Baseline Imager, which is on board both the GOES 16 and 17 platforms, has a land surface temperature product that is a two kilometer spatial resolution available at one hour intervals. A similar product is available for the entire full disk view of both satellites at one hour intervals However, that's at a 10 kilometer spatial resolution. The one hour temporal availability of land surface temperature data from the GOES ABI sensor offers diurnal day through night observations of land surface temperature that, for example, can supplement the hourly diurnal air temperature observations that have been found to be significant 
and the impact of heat wave conditions on human health. The benefit of land surface temperature observations to supplement air temperature observations is displayed on this map of the climate observation stations that provide diurnal air temperature observations in the Atlanta, Georgia region. The number of the in situ air temperature stations, even in a major metropolitan region, can be relatively few. And the distances between the stations, in this example, are typically 15 kilometers or greater. The figures on this slide present the major land surface types of the Atlanta region on the left side and the GOES observed land surface temperature at 11 a.m. local time on the right side. Note that there are areas within the urban defined regions that likely due to presence of vegetation display cooler land surface temperatures than the other areas in the urban region. The hourly diurnal land surface temperature for the four major land surface types in the Atlanta region are displayed here to demonstrate how land surface temperatures vary throughout a day for different land surfaces. Hourly land surface temperature values observed by the GOES ABI sensor were acquired for the four major land cover classes at the locations identified in the left figure. The hourly land surface temperature data are displayed on the right figure with the colors of the temperature values corresponding to the colors used to designate the land surface types. Note how the land surface temperature observed for the urban location, which happens to be Atlanta's Hartsfield International Airport, is relatively warmer throughout the day and night compared to the other non-water surfaces. The hourly diurnal land surface temperature values for the vegetated land surface types, the woody savanna and mixed forest are similar, and the water surface is relatively constant over that time period. When the land surface temperature and air temperature are compared for the urban and rural, in this example, the woody savanna locations, the difference between the two temperatures is much greater during the daytime in the urban environment, that upper right figure. This phenomena as was mentioned in the first session of the urban heat island mapping training, is primarily due to the sun's radiation being absorbed by the asphalt and other impervious surfaces associated with the urban environment and converted to sensible heat. While in the rural vegetated environment, a portion of the solar radiation is used in the evapotranspiration of the available moisture associated with the vegetation. The difference between the air and land surface temperature can be used as an indicator of the lack of moisture availability. When the observed difference is large, as in this example, the area may be dominated by an impervious surfaces. Vegetated areas that are experiencing drought conditions and a lack of available moisture may also exhibit differences between the land surface temperature and air temperatures. Now that you've seen some examples of the data, let's review some sources of where you may obtain the data. The GOES land surface temperature product is available from several sources. The NOAA Comprehensive Large Area Data Stewardship System, or CLASS, is the primary NOAA data archive and distribution system and was also mentioned in the initial training session on the urban heat island mapping topic. Other sources include NOAA's Archive Information Request System, which provides for inventory and ordering of GOES products, and NOAA's Weather and Climate Toolkit. The Weather and Climate Toolkit can be downloaded to your computer and facilitates the inventory and retrieval of data, in this example, from a cloud service, it allows users to view the data. This is an example of land surface temperature for the contaminants US. And it permits custom processing of the data. For example, you can order 
multiple uh, land surface temperature products uh, throughout a day or several days. And the toolkit provides the capability to output the data in numerous formats, including a comma-separated value tabular data format. An example is presented for the output retrieved for a single location in time with the LST value, land surface temperature value, the latitude, and the longitude values. In addition to the tabular format, several other formats are available, including GeoTIFF images as well as NetCDF. So I hope you will find the GOES ABI data useful, and thank you for your interest. And now I'll pass it back over to Sean. Thank you, Kevin. For our final presentation, we are excited to be joined by Greta Paris, Sabine Nix, Thomas Quintero, and Amanda Tomlinson from the NASA DEVELOP program. They will be presenting their project, utilizing NASA Earth observations to evaluate urban tree canopy and land surface temperature for green infrastructure development and urban heat mitigation in Huntsville, Alabama. Over to you, team. Thank you so much, Sean. All right, so let's get started. The study area for this project was Huntsville, Alabama, which is located in North Alabama and has a population of 2,574. The climate for this area is humid subtropical with hot, humid summers and mild to cool winters. We chose several state case study areas for this project, such as downtown Huntsville, Oak Park, Research Park, Owens Crossroads, and Harvest, which were of interest to our partners. The study period that we looked at was from 2010 to 2019 because Huntsville has experienced increased urban expansion within this time frame, and we looked at the summer months of June 1st to August 31st within this time frame because the urban heat island effect is most detrimental during the summer. Yeah, so in terms of our community concerns, Huntsville, Alabama is actually the fastest growing city in Alabama with a population growth rate of nearly 11% from 2010 to 2019. And this rapid growth comes with rapid urban expansion and everything that comes along with that. And it is projected that 20 million hectares of trees will be lost in the United States to population growth and the associated urban expansion by the year 2040. This loss in tree canopy could result in an enhanced urban heat island effect, which are caused by um, replacing forested areas with impervious surfaces. And these kinds of surfaces like to hold on to heat, which raise temperatures in more urban areas. These raised temperatures caused by the urban heat island effect can lead to a variety of different health problems for vulnerable populations, especially those with existing medical conditions such as asthma, diabetes, or pulmonary disorders. So to address these community concerns, um, our team partnered with the city of Huntsville in several departments within the city of Huntsville, including urban and economic development, geographic information systems, and city engineering. This is the city's first investigation into the urban heat island effect, as there were concerns raised by constituents regarding the loss of trees in Huntsville and the relating increase in temperature that could be possible with the loss of trees. The objectives for this project were to investigate and analyze correlations between tree canopy coverage and land surface temperature. We also wanted to quantify the impacts of Huntsville's urban expansion on decreasing tree canopy coverage and increasing impervious surface coverage. Next, we wanted to identify hotspots within the city that are experiencing the urban heat island effect and the vulnerable populations that might live within them. And lastly, we wanted to communicate our findings through an ArcGIS story map to serve as a community outreach tool. Um, to complete these objectives, uh, the team utilized several different satellites and sensors um, in order to investigate the existence of the urban heat island effect in Huntsville. We used the Landsat 5 TM and the Landsat 8 OLI to create land cover maps, and then the Landsat 5 TM, the Landsat 8 OLI, and TIERS Terra Modis and EcoStress were used to calculate land surface temperature 
And finally, the team used JEDI to analyze tree canopy cover. In addition to the satellites and sensors previously mentioned, we also utilized several ancillary data sets. The U.S. Census Bureau Tiger Line population data and health statistics from the Centers for Disease Control were used in the urban heat health risk map. We also used the USGS National Land Cover Database, or NLCD data, as training data in our supervised land classifications. The USDA National Agriculture Imagery Program, or NAEP, was used to create a data set that we then used to create confusion matrices to validate these land cover classifications. Pairing with our ancillary data sets, we collected many NASA Earth observations in order to create valuable end products for the city. We began by collecting Landsat images through a Google Earth Engine script, where all images were first cloud masked to ensure the highest data quality. We then conducted two types of land cover classification methods, as well as produced land surface temperature time series maps. Then using data related to heat vulnerability from the CDC and Census Bureau, we created a census track level urban heat health risk map resulting from our principal component analysis in R. And in order to point, pinpoint the hottest city, city spots, we acquired terra modis and eco stress images from up here, resulting in a UHI identification map. Finally, JEDI data was downloaded from NASA Earth data, processed through an R script with the R JEDI package, and resulted in a 3D tree canopy cover survey map. So now to provide a little bit more detail on the methodology we use to create our land cover classifications, we created a series of these classifications using Landsat 5 and Landsat 8 in Google Earth Engine. After applying a cloud mask to all imagery, we calculated the Normalized Difference Built Up Index, or NDBI, and the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI. Then we combined these images by calculating the median pixel value to end up with one image per summer per year. We conducted two types of classifications. The first one was a threshold classification, where we classified by setting thresholds for the indices corresponding to different land cover types. Next, we conducted a supervised classification where we used NLCD data as training data. This slide demonstrates some of the results of our supervised classifications from 2010 to 2019. It's clear from the GIF that downtown area of Huntsville, which is highlighted in the inset map, is consistently classified as having high levels of impervious surface cover, which as we will see later on, has implications for its high land surface temperature. To validate our classifications, we created confusion matrices for the years 2011, 2015, and 2017. We manually classified roughly 150 randomly selected points in Google Earth Engine and then created confusion matrices in our studio. The overall accuracy across the years ranged from about 70 to 75%, which is in line for remotely sensed data, especially with the slightly coarser resolution of the Landsat imagery. Here we illustrate the change in tree cover from the summers of 2010 to 2019, averaged by census tract in all of Huntsville. Notice how many of these census tracts have a light green to dark green color, indicating a dominantly positive change in tree cover. In fact, overall, we observed a 3% increase in tree coverage with all of these census tracts averaged together. Although mainly positive, there were some severe decreases in tree cover in some census tracts, such as that one in the southeast edge, census tract 202.02, .02, with a loss of 8% tree cover. Seeing the trends in tree cover over time led us to want to visualize the relationship of these three-dimensional trees to the respective land surface temperature. So we collected level 2b JEDI data, which includes biophysical variables such as plant area index and tree height. These data had to first be converted from the raw files clipped to the region of interest and downloaded from the NASA Earth data site to files editable in ArcGIS using an R package called RJEDI. The JEDI LiDAR data was overlaid on the 2019 land surface temperature map and the Esri World DEM. Now every LiDAR point must have passed the quality inspection and had over 40% tree coverage. And then the first and last returns were subtracted to obtain the tree height. Then a histogram was produced of plant area index and tree height to describe the tree canopy structure. Plant area index 
is a measurement of leaf area index, but for the entire plant, which is a fraction of how many layers of vegetation inhibit sunlight before reaching the ground. So in the graphic at the bottom right, green layers would be vegetation layers and the brown would be the ground. So you can see this graphic is a representation of a plant area index of three, because there's three layers of vegetation between the sun and the ground. The area in, this area in Southwest Huntsville was highlighted because of the crossing Jedi transects that show the high correlation of forested areas and low land surface temperatures. It appears that trees slice through areas of high temperature to cool the surrounding ground. We also found that the average tree height in all of Huntsville was around 82 feet and a plant area index of three. So now we can get into the methodology behind how we calculated land surface temperature. So first we acquired Landsat 5 and Landsat 8 data using Google Earth Engine and calculated NDVI to derive emissivity. From there, we converted our land surface temperature data from Kelvin to Fahrenheit, and we produced a land surface temperature time series using monthly medians from 2010 to 2019 of our imagery. Next, we acquired MODIS and EcoStress data from USGS Appears, and we converted it from Kelvin to degrees Fahrenheit and produced day versus nighttime land surface temperature maps. Here are some of the results of our land surface temperature time series analysis. And as you can see, downtown Huntsville was one of the areas that exhibited the highest land surface temperatures within this study period. Here are the, are the results from our urban heat island identification map. The urban heat island identification map uses Landsat 8 tiers images for land surface temperature averaged over June through August of 2019 at a resolution of 100 meters to identify urban heat islands in Huntsville. We highlighted five census tracts that are representative of key areas in the city, such as Harvest, Alabama, Oak Park, Downtown Huntsville, Research Park, and Owens Crossroads. Each of these areas have differing land cover types, but downtown Huntsville has high impervious surfaces, and this sort of correlates with the high land surface temperatures that we can see in this image. Here are more results of our urban heat island identification maps um, looking at daytime versus nighttime land surface temperature. So our daytime land surface temperature map came from um, ISS EcoStress and our nighttime land surface temperature map came from Terra Modis data, and they are both for June 12th of 2020. What's interesting about these maps is that the areas that have the highest land surface temperature during the day retain that high land surface temperature during the night. So it shows that the urban heat island effect can not only be a threat during the day, but at night as well. This slide illustrates the change in land surface temperature from 2010 to 2019 and is defined by census tracts in the city of Huntsville area. The most severe increases in land surface temperature are downtown Huntsville and the tracts surrounding downtown Huntsville. And overall, every census tract has experienced an increase in land surface temperature over time. Here are some further results of our time series analysis of land surface temperature increase. Our team created time series graphs for each of the five census tracts that experienced the largest increases in land surface temperature. The time series maps were created using the supervised classification maps and land surface temperature maps averaged over each census tract. The five census tracts that were experiencing the highest rates of land surface temperature increase were all concentrated in the downtown region of Huntsville. While the city overall experienced an increase of roughly four degrees Fahrenheit, these five census tracts experienced increases of up to eight degrees Fahrenheit. These tracts have some of the lowest tree cover in the city and relatively high amounts of impervious surface cover. Increasing green space or tree cover in these tracts may help to mitigate the extreme temperatures that populations in downtown Huntsville experience. We also decided to make time series graphs for the five census tracts that experienced the highest rates of tree cover loss over the study period. These time series graphs were also created using the supervised classification maps over each census tract. Each of the five census tracts experiencing the highest rates of tree cover loss shared similar percent cover values for tree cover and impervious cover. Each census tract had around 20% impervious cover or less and tree cover ranging roughly from 20% to 60%. Uh, 
And while these areas may be experiencing a loss of tree cover due to development, it's important to note that most of these census tracts are not experiencing a substantial increase in impervious cover at the same time that they are losing tree cover. Based on suggestions from the city of Huntsville, the team also conducted time series analyses of five census tracts that are of particular interest to the partners. So like the pre previous time series graphs, these were created using the supervised classification maps and land surface temperature maps averaged over each census tract. And these census tracts were determined because they show a variety of different land cover types and development patterns. So to better understand the relationship between land cover and land surface temperature in Huntsville, the team compared each census tract's percent tree cover and land surface temperature, as well as each census tract's impervious surface cover and land surface temperature in scatter plots. So the literature surrounding urban heat islands describes that impervious surfaces tend to exacerbate the urban heat island effect, while trees and other vegetation types can help mitigate extreme temperatures. As expected, based on the literature, the data from Huntsville confirms that census tract with higher percentages of tree cover have substantially lower temperatures. The graph above demonstrates that land surface temperature actually decreases logarithmically with increasing tree cover. This suggests that small differences in tree cover may have outsized effects on urban heat mitigation when the census tract has between 0 and 10 percent tree cover. On the other hand, increasing the percent tree cover above 40 or 50 percent may have less noticeable effects on continued temperature decreases. This may also be due in part to the fact that census tracts with less tree cover tend to also have higher rates of impervious surface cover, which also plays a role in affecting land surface temperature. So it's important to remember that these variables are not completely independent of each other. And this graph shows the relationship between land surface temperature and impervious surface cover by census tract. Again, as expected, we found that land surface temperature increases linearly with increasing impervious surface cover, meaning that census tracts with higher impervious, sur impervious surface cover tend to have higher temperatures. Once we saw this relationship in the data, we wanted to find out how that relationship held up spatially. A local bivariate analysis compares the relationship between two variables to determine how they are correlated above a 90% confidence interval. This map shows the relationship of tree loss to land surface temperature change. Now, when significant, the relationship between the two variables are linearly negative or concavely negative. This negative result is what we expect because as tree cover declines, we would expect land surface temperature to increase. Now, if we zoom into two census tracts in particular, that are on opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, now, if we zoom into two census tracts in particular that are on opposite ends of the spectrum, we see the Oak Park area, which is right next to the Montesano State Park, having dense tree cover and consequently low surface temperature, while downtown has high land surface temperature and low tree cover. The data, when viewed spatially throughout the city, supports the idea that land surface temperature decreases with more tree cover. Multivariate clustering is a tool that groups areas together based on shared standardized variables. In this case, the areas we are grouping are census tracts. The variables we selected were land surface temperature, tree cover, and impervious cover. We observed four distinct clusters. Now let's take a closer look at what these clusters are describing. Specifically, let's take a look at cluster three. Notice how this cluster focuses in on the highly developed downtown area with very low tree cover and very high land surface temperature. Based on the remotely sensed data, the census tracts in the downtown area naturally group together. You can see the same results in cluster four on the east side of the city, largely in Montesano State Park, which has very high tree cover, very low developed area, and very low land surface temperature. So without any input of us telling the tool where downtown is or where the state park is, the multivariate clustering analysis is able to point out where areas behave differently or the same, strictly based on unbiased NASA Earth observations. That is how strong the relationship is between tree cover, developed area, and land surface temperature. The last product that we wanted to create was a heat vulnerability map. And here is um, a little dive into the methodology that we used to create that. So we gathered health data from the CDC and age data from the census. 
And we combined this with the Earth observation data that we've been talking about, um, averaged over census tracts, and that included impervious surface cover, tree cover, and land surface temperature. We then used an R code to perform three separate principal component analyses, one that focused on the environmental variables, one that focused on the health and age variables, and then a final principal component analysis that combined the two to create our heat vulnerability index, which is displayed in our urban heat health risk map. And here is that urban health and here is that urban heat health risk map um, with those really dark red census tracts showing um, the highest vulnerability and the pale yellow shade showing the lowest vulnerability. And as we can see, the populations that are the most vulnerable to the urban heat island effect are located downtown where we've previously seen that they are experiencing the highest increase in LST and lower percentages of tree cover. So moving on to the conclusions that we derived from this project, um, we determined that land surface temperature has increased by approximately four degrees Fahrenheit across the city, with some census tracts seeing increases as high as eight degrees Fahrenheit, while tree cover has increased by 3% across the city within a study period of 2010 to 2019. Urban expansion in Huntsville has not substantially impacted tree canopy cover from 2010 to 2019, and we found that land surface temperature has a linear increase in developed areas and decreases logarithmically in relation to tree cover. Through our urban heat island identification maps, we found that highly developed areas such as downtown Huntsville and the Huntsville International Airport exhibited the highest temperatures. From our areas of interest, north downtown Huntsville had one of the highest heat vulnerability scores. Some of the limitations that we experienced through this project were through the creation of confusion matrices for land cover classification, our overall accuracies for the validated years ranged between 70 to 75%. And while this is really good for remotely sensed data, this could be improved with ground truthing methods. Cloud cover also varied from year to year, which may have reduced some of our results. And also the ISS JEDI mission is ongoing, so JEDI transects were not available for the entire city of Huntsville study area. And lastly, the NASA develop Huntsville Urban Development Team at Marshall Space Flight Center would like to thank our science advisors, develop mentors, and project partners. Um, thank you all so much for being here and for listening to our project. Thank you, Greta, Sabine, Thomas, and Amanda, and to all our presenters for such informative presentations. We will now transition to the question and answer session. As a reminder, please enter your questions into the Q&A box. We will answer them in the order they were received. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you everybody for joining and sticking around for the question and answer session. Um, why don't we just jump right into it? Uh, the first question, that we have from our uh, uh, participants is in an urban area, what criteria do you consider for choosing places to collect air temperature and humidity data with data loggers? In identifying urban heat islands, is it necessary to collect air temperature and humidity data from rural areas also? And I'll pass this over to George Xion to answer. Yes, uh, let me see. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good. Yeah, I have provide pos I have I provide my answer partially in the right and uh, language uh, uh, words and but also I wanted to uh, emphasize that currently we only collect the land surface temperature from satellite. We don't collect uh, air temperature understand if you wanted to do some uh, regional or local analysis, you need to collect those air temperatures. So based on our experiences, when you collect those temperature, you should choose both high intensity and low intensity urban area. And uh, of course, you need also collect those, uh, those data, air temperature and humidity in, in the rural area. Then in that way, you can compare the urban area and the rural area, so you can calculate what we call urban heat island intensity. Uh, 
Okay, and uh, question number two, how can we get access to the code uh, uh, Dr. Xi'an mentioned uh, in applicable to study to, applicable to study urban heat islands in other cities? So I guess they're referring to whatever code uh, Georgie might have used, so they can use it maybe in a different city of their study area. And I'll pass it over to you for an answer. Yes. Uh, currently, we have developed a program to process land surface temperature from satellite records, and uh, the main the main goal for this uh, uh, for this program uh, uh, for this uh, program is to use so-called automatic processing way to handle land surface data because currently we're focusing on long-term over 33 or 34 years land surface record. That means for each pixel we may collect over 2,000 Landsat record, we call a clear record. Then we're going to use this record to calculate annual mean, seasonal mean, uh, temperature. So in that way, the program can be used to uh, directly process those temperature data. And the second part of for this program is we're going to use the similar automatic way to uh, use this data to calculate the urban heat island intensity for our selected urban. So right now, the pro uh, this project is still developing those programs, and we finish partial uh, first part of this pro uh, the program. We're still uh, working on the second part. So when this program is ready, we're going to release those all the code to the public, and anyone can use this code to process their landsat data. So just keep watching our uh, USGS science-based website. So when we uh, get ready to that, that stage, we're going to release our program uh, to public users. And George, as a follow-up to that, it sounds like you're validating a lot of this in urban areas within the United States. When you do release that code and it's, and it's publicly facing on the USGS website, would that code be applicable to other cities internationally, say in South America, Asia, or Africa? Yes, yes. Uh, as long as you're going to use uh, Landsat record, Landsat data to do the urban heat island study, not just urban, you can, if you wanted to get, use that Landsat data to access your or land set surface temperature, you want to process data, you can use this code, no problem, anywhere. Fantastic, thank you so much for that. Uh, question number three, for a city experiencing temporal floods, how do you estimate the actual land surface temperature and or urban heat island for planning or mitigation purposes? Uh, well, the current, current way we did is we using Landsat only and uh, if for the flooding period if we have a clear Landsat record pre after flooding uh, time we can we can estimate UHI no problem but uh, you know during the flooding time a lot of uh, based on our experiences we have a cloud cover sometimes it's very difficult to use Landsat to calculate the urban heat island effect if we have cloud cover. But in the future, we're going to uh, use the technology called the data fusion way to use both lab models and also eco stress data to help us to improve the temporal the coverage. For example, currently the Landsat re revisit cycle is every 16 days. If we use two satellites, we have about eight day recycling uh, revisit, revisit time. But in the future, if we use a lens of uh, motors and uh, also eco stress, we can reduce that to the daily. And uh, so in that way, we can just uh, improve our monitoring capabilities. So that's in the future, we're going to intend to do that. Great. And question number four, I believe this is also for George. What is the method used to pan sharpen the thermal data using the optical bands in particular do you use land cover in the process? The answer is we we currently we just test to use a very simple uh, method just provided by Erdas Imagine a software, uh, Pencha uh, software. So we can uh, function. We can just use that function to use land surface temperature plus high resolution uh, also image either air photos or, or others. Uh, satellite image like the auto view auto view three 
image, we can use that those images to help us to pan shop. We don't use land cover. Okay, great. Um, and question number five, also for George, uh, why did the urban heat island intensity and hotspot decrease in 2016 compared to 1986 from the Sioux Falls city center? Okay, great. That's a good question. Uh, I, I believe you got this conclusion by looking at our annual temperature uh, differences uh, in 80, 86 and also 2016. That's annual temperature. If you look at the annual temperature estimate, uh, you have to rem remember two things. One is uh, the annual temperature is using all clear land set record. So sometimes if for that year, specific year, we have very limited landslide record. For example, uh, in the summer seasons, normally we have a higher temperature in the ground in the summer. But if that summer we have many cloud cover days, we may miss some hot day records. So if you use that record to calculate the annual mean, sometimes you're going to see relatively lower temperature compared with the year we have a lot of a clear record in the summer. So that is the reason. So that is why when we do this work, we look at the historical trends rather than just look at a single year. So that is why look at the historical trend is important. Okay, great. Thank you, George. And uh, I believe this is also uh, for you. Uh, George, on slide 23, you showed urban heat island intensity uh, for Sioux Falls in 2016, where stripes of colder land surface temperature are noticeable. Uh, the participant uh, is assuming you use Landsat 7, who has scan line error, uh, because that, uh, which would imply that that is why that data was lost. Why didn't you use Landsat 8 instead? In addition to that, how big of a problem is using Landsat 7 data? Good question. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, carefully look at the, those slides. Yes, uh, the example we show in 2016, uh, the strap is caused by Landsat 7 record. As I mentioned, when we uh, process land surface temperature from a, a Landsat record, we use all available Landsat record. For example, pre-2003, we use both Landsat 7 and Landsat 5. And after 2003, we use uh, we use Landsat Landsat 7, and also we use Landsat 8 when Landsat 8 is available. And uh, you <clears throat> the question that why we just use Landsat 8 instead of uh, just uh, Landsat 7, as I mentioned, because Landsat 8, if you use single uh, sensors, the visit revisit the times every 16 days. So if we don't have Landsat 8 data in some time, and uh, we, that means we're going to miss some observations. So, but uh, if we have Landsat 7 data on some days, clear observation we call, we're going to use Landsat 7 data. And the program currently processes both Landsat and Landsat 8 data to calculate the so-called seasonal mean and also annual mean. And, but sometimes if we use Landsat 7 data, we're going to see that strap effect. But based on our current estimate, that effect is not as serious. And we can still estimate the temperature variations pixel by pixel. Uh, although uh, visually we, we may see that strap, but uh, when we can compare with annual mean, even seasonal mean, we don't find that problem is, uh, that strap cause any serious problem. Okay, wonderful. And George, I believe question <clears throat> seven is also for you over Chicago. While the land surface temperature patterns observed by Landsat and EcoStress look similar, the absolute land surface temperature levels and contrast seems different. Are the observed differences related to the local observation time, or are they related to instrumental and or processing effects? Good question. Good question. Yes, you know, I, 
I didn't mention the clear clearly in my uh, talk. For eco stress and Landsat, we have to remember for the Landsat observation, usually the record image was taken at about 10.30 in the morning time, local morning time. And eco stress for this specific case in Chicago, the image was taken in the early, I think around 7.30 and 8 o'clock around that time. So you can see there are about uh, two to three hours differences when we record the uh, temperature. So definitely you're going to see Landsat record got a relatively higher uh, temperature compared with eco stress. And uh, at the same time, I think right now we don't do uh, both sensors uh, calibration for eco stress to Landsat. We haven't done that yet for our current study. So you're going to see slightly difference between the eco stress and the uh, Landsat, but mainly those differences are caused by the observation time. So I want to use this example to show you the eco stress is available in early time, but we, if we don't have Landsat, we can use eco stress. That's our future. We call it data fusion. We want to kind of use um, different sensors uh, record to help us to improve our uh, land surface temperature calculation. Great. Yeah, very good question. Um, and uh, question number eight in slide 25, uh, and I believe this is also for George, the R squared doesn't show a significant relationship between minimum temperature and 90th percentile uh, for the hot days. How can you explain this? Yeah, good question. Uh, it's not significant in Atlanta for uh, for the current uh, analysis result. Uh, we that's just a, and also remember, this is just from one weather station, not because in, around that area, uh, inside urban and non-urban area, we have more than one. Totally, I think I remember we have about thirteen different weather stations. We only look at the one because you know uh, we haven't look at every uh, station yet but uh, i believe for this one uh, it shows is not significant but we can still see the trends and we don't we don't expect every every station we're going to show that significant uh, trend features but it's just 90 percentile and if we go to uh, other stations and uh, other time that may show the different patterns. So this is just the example we want to uh, demonstrate uh, the air temperature trends. Okay, and this is next question is for Kevin. Uh, in in Kevin Gallo's presentation, uh, specifically slide seven, he shows the Veers land surface type product, but Veers is not on GOES, correct? I'm asking because I would like to learn how to create the graph on the right on slide eight. Kevin, can you answer that? Yes, uh, as mentioned, this is a great example of the use of uh, multi-sensor data and products. There currently isn't a land surface type GOES derived product. So the VIRS land surface type product was used to identify the locations of those land cover types the land, um, the latitude and longitude were extracted from the VIRS land surface type product and then used to extract the land surface temperature data from the GOES product. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, uh, great. Another great example of uh, a data fusion. Um, uh, question 10, I'm going to pass it over to George. Um, I don't know if you can answer it, but uh, how did you calculate uh, eco stress? Okay, good, good question. Actually, uh, for eco stress data, we don't we don't do the, any calculation by ourselves. That means eco stress provide a surface temperature information. So we just directly uh, load download all this data and then to do the very limited processing to do some regist geo registration process and make sure that all the pixels align each other uh, for the Landsat. So we just do very limited processing and we didn't do any calculation. Actually, all the calculation was uh, accomplished by the, the team of EcoStress. I, I wanted to acknowledge that. 
Great, and I'll, I'll use this, thank you, George, and I'll use this opportunity as well to uh, plug that RSET did do a training uh, on EcoStress, not from the team that you're listening to currently, but by colleagues of ours, uh, uh, oh. different members of the RSET team. So we highly encourage you to go to our website uh, to learn mm -hmm. more about how the data is acquired and, and any processing they might have done uh, to derive the, uh, the products that they deliver um, through, through JPL. So uh, anyway, so a plug for a different RSET training, but let's, uh, let's stay focused on this one because this is the uh, important one at hand. So question 11, uh, this is going to Kevin as well. Given the GOES platform uh, advanced baseline imagers five minute acquisition frequency, uh, are there any plans to generate land surface temperature at sub hourly frequency? Uh, even, uh, for example, for heat wave uh, events that might be occurring. So that certainly would be a good application of the data. I am aware, as mentioned, that the data are actually available at higher frequencies, but the coverage is limited. For example, if there is a severe storm event or some of the recent um, fires in the western U.S., they focus in on those areas and retrieve mesoscale um, at high frequencies. So the, the capability exists. However, I'm not sure if the channels used in the derivation of the land surface temperatures are available. And I am um, relaying that question to the GOES program staff and um, for their consideration. It's a, it's a good, good suggestion. Thank you. Great, yeah, thank you so much, Kevin, for that. And if we, uh, for those that are aware that we will be posting this to the RSET website. So if we are able to get that answer uh, in the next week or so, we will certainly uh, place that, uh, whatever the answer we're able to receive in this Q&A doc. So, um, so stay tuned uh, for, for that. Uh, question number 12. Is it important to relate dry or wet seasons to higher or lower land surface temperature? And I'll pass this off to Sabine. Yeah, so I'm not sure if this question was meant for the Huntsville team, um, but I can do my best to answer it. So I think in general, this would depend on the context of the area being studied. So for Huntsville, it made more sense for us to compare hot seasons versus cooler seasons. So we looked specifically at the summer, but I'm sure in different contexts, depending on the area and the types of seasons, um, it, it could make sense to also compare dry versus wet. Um, yeah. Great, yeah, thanks so much for that. Uh, and question 13, uh, for the Huntsville example, what were the age and health characteristics of the high vulnerability areas. Amanda, did you answer this one? I did. So in our project for Huntsville, we used um, the factors we used were population over 65 and then the rates in each census tract of diabetes, asthma, hypertension, COPD, and obesity. As um, through our research, we figured those were the um, like health conditions that could intensify um, people's reactions to intense heat. Um, and then for context, the most vulnerable census tracts had an average LST of nearly 90 degrees Fahrenheit and um, health varying health uh, percentages that I've listed there. So about 40% over 65 and obese, 52% um, hypertension, 11% COPD and asthma, and then about 20% diabetes. Great. Yeah, it's so so important that you were able to bring those uh, those statistics into the analysis. I think that that certainly uh, shed light on a lot of uh, some of the risk within within the city of Huntsville. So really, really terrific job doing that. Uh, question 14. This looks like it has to do with the story map that you had referenced, but uh, didn't um, show, unfortunately. But can you post the URL for the story map uh, hunting for heat in Huntsville? Um, the story map is currently in the process of going through export control through develop so that it can be publicly accessed. Um, hopefully that will be through that process soon. Um, as soon as it is, we will pass that link on to our set team so they can um, make that available to anybody who's interested. 
Great, thank you, Amanda. And we will certainly uh, we will certainly post that to this Q and A doc as soon as that is publicly uh, facing. We will go back and edit this and, and make sure that that's uh, available for for all the listeners today. Uh, so, George, this is another question for you. Question 15, uh, Dr. Xiang, can you please explain the method used to generate the albedo map for an urban area? Oh, wow, good question. Uh, uh, I think I, I'd like to say, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, 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 other people. So this is graphics actually is from uh, one publication uh, from uh, one journal from the I cannot remember exactly, but I, I write down the author's name over there, but it's not from my work currently. But the, my understanding that they use the both modus, the product, modus estimate uh, albedo uh, data, and also use albedo, albedo data from provided by modus, and also use NLCD national land cover data generated from UHGS and uh, separate for to the different uh, land cover and the land they use information and then gather the albedo map. Terrific. Um, and question 16, given the 16 day revisit frequency of Landsat and the issue identified with differential cloud related missingness, I like that word, uh, was there any attempt to account for seasonality or use a higher temporal frequency sensor like MODIS? To wait the summary and we'll pass it off to the develop team and if anybody else wants to answer after them please do yeah so in huntsville we used landsat 5 and landsat 8 just because we were mostly interested in having a higher spatial resolution um, and the cloud released the cloud related missingness that you noticed was mostly an issue for us in one year so we didn't look to include another sensor to overcome this problem just also given time constraints and then in terms of seasonality, we did only look at the summer months, so June through August, and that was in order to try to keep our analyses consistent and to avoid any huge differences in cloud-related missingness. Great, thank you so much for that answer. Uh, question 17, what is the unit of vulnerability? <laughs> Yeah, so for the Huntsville team, when we were calculating vulnerability, the resulting, the final resulting score that we based the map and stuff off of does not have a unit. So um, vulnerability for Huntsville was um, calculated using three different principal component analyses, one that combined the environmental variables such as LST and DBI and NDBI to create a heat exposure index. Then the PCA, second PCA used age and health data to create a heat sensitivity index. And then those were combined in one final principal component analysis to create the heat vulnerability index. And the resulting value is a score that is unitless. Uh, and for context, the most vulnerable tract had an HV, HVI score of um, about five, while the least vulnerable tract had a score of about negative 3.5. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, question 18. Uh, and this is also for the develop team. Do you have R code for the Alabama research in a public repository? Um, and the R code that we use to um, do the HVI stuff is currently not available to the public. It was, um, we modified a code that was created by another developed participant. Um, and for that to be publicly available, it would have to go through develop software release, which it has not yet, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of this is hung up in uh, uh, export control and elsewhere. But as soon as that code is publicly available, uh, we'll certainly circle back to uh, include those links into this Q&A doc. So even though we might post it uh, before the code is, has finished its review, uh, we will go back at some undetermined time in the future and we will uh, add links to that um, repository for whoever asked that question. And we'll certainly follow up with uh, Sabine and Amanda at that time. So question 19, uh, how is SLC off correction implemented in the LST product? Yeah, so I'm not sure if this was aimed specifically at the Huntsville team, but for us, um, unless I'm mistaken, and maybe someone else who's more of an expert in this can also speak to it, but I believe that this SLC off correction is something that's used when utilizing Landsat 7 imagery. 
Um, so in order to avoid this, in Huntsville, we only used Landsat 5 and Landsat 8, um, but someone else might be able to speak to this more generally than me. Okay, great. I think we'll we'll move on to the next question just because we have a number and we only have five minutes left. So uh, question 20, how can one create an LSD product uh, comparable to the analysis ready data LSD product uh, for cities outside the United States? Are there any references or journal articles describing the processes or algorithms? Well, I will, I will reference the, uh, the first part of this three-part webinar training. Well, we provided uh, a open source code to calculate land surface temperature derived from Landsat uh, 4 through 8, uh, and that is for anywhere. Uh, and the, we also posted links to the publication in which you can read how the uh, algorithms were, were, uh, were created. So we would, uh, I would emphasize and, and suggest that you go back to part one of this webinar series and you will be able to derive uh, land surface temperature from Landsat for anywhere on the planet. The products that were described today were analysis ready data sets from the USGS. Um, but I would suggest going back to part one of the webinar series uh, to learn more uh, if you are, if your study area is, is outside of the conterminous United States. Uh, and we also have uh, links to the following. So thank you for. Uh, George putting that in. And question 21, what is the difference between uh, land surface temperature and atmospheric temperature in relation to the urban heat island? So I can jump in here. So LST refers to the land surface temperature, um, which is the temperature of the surfaces on the land. Um, and then LST is correlated, but it's not the same as the atmospheric temperature or air temperature which is more directly related to what individuals are experiencing when you walk outside and experience heat. Um, so LST is commonly used in remote sensing projects just because it's easily calculated from Landsat, which is what um, I think a few of us did, and that's what we did in Huntsville. Great, and, and I'll also make a plug too, if you go back to the first part of this webinar series, uh, we do go into detail about explaining the differences between land surface and atmospheric uh, temperature uh, and how it relates to urban heat island. But moving on, question 22. So the amount of scenes used per year to find annual average land surface temperature varies. For example, some years have 12 scenes, uh, some have eight scenes, and others have 20 scenes, et cetera. So again, I'm not sure if this was specifically for the Huntsville team, but if it is, then yes, this is correct. Um, each year did have a slightly different number of scenes, just depending on data availability. Um, but we did look specifically at June through August. So within that time, yes, the number of scenes did vary. Yeah, I, for this one, I want to jump in for our annual uh, average uh, LST calculation. We use all we call the all available clear record from Landsat. So if you if you if we treat that uh, annual mean, we call the clear record annual mean. So sometimes you know we miss some some seasons, but uh, but based on our current estimate, at least for one seasons, uh, we at least have a several record. Not not not, but the record definitely varies every year by year. Yeah, that's a great point. And thank you, George and Sabine, uh, for, for, uh, for highlighting that. And the last question uh, for our today's session, uh, also, were any adjustments made to calculations for land surface temperature because you were using different satellites, say a mix of uh, Landsat 5 and 8? Yeah, so for the Huntsville team, this is definitely something that we would have liked to do if we had more than the 10 weeks of the short develop term. Um, because you're right that there are slight differences in the wavelength ranges associated with Landsat 5 and Landsat 8, um, but we didn't notice any major differences over our study area, so we just did not make any adjustment adjustments, but that's something that we would have done if we had more time. 
Yeah, I want also one weigh in. Uh, in the USGS, uh, we have the Landsat Science team uh, to deal with all our Landsat product. So for the Landsat surface temperature calculation, we have the algorithm to uh, to handle Lens, both Landsat 5, Landsat 7, and Landsat 8. And then we try to use a calibration method to make sure all the record from both sensors, all the three sensors, according to each other. So, uh, and then we would pro produce lens separate temperature that can be used to, to come, we call it a comparable uh, for, from different sensors. Well, thank you. We have successfully gotten through all of the questions. So thank you for everybody that contributed. And for everybody who's listening, uh, for all the participants that have joined us for all three parts of this webinar series, Satellite Remote Sensing for Urban Heat Island, uh, we greatly appreciate it. And again, we will be posting this Q&A doc to the RSET uh, training page, hopefully by next week. Uh, there might be some time because we have a national holiday in the United States, but uh, so that might slow things down, but we will get things up uh, as soon as we can. Uh, I want to have a big thanks to George Sheon from the USGS, Kevin Gallo from NOAA, and the entire develop team, Amanda Tomlinson, Sabine Nix, Thomas Quintero, as well as Greta Paris, for all contributing to this last part of this, uh, of this training. Uh, and also, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, Amida Mekta, Brock Blevins, Jonathan O'Brien, and Selwyn hudson Odoy from the RSET team for working tirelessly uh, behind the scenes to make this training such a success. So thank you to everybody. Uh, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you at the next RSET training. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Sean.